Welcome back to Atrium Talks. Hi, Bhagwan. Hi, Deepa. So, Bhagwan, in the last episode, we talked about how the pandemic and the world after is seeing a lot of innovation in work, in new business models. I want to kickstart this episode by asking you, what do you think is the one defining characteristic of countries and societies that promote, foster these kinds of innovations, radical ones, incremental ones, but innovations in general? In one word, Deepa, I will say freedom. There is a lot of literature in economics that shows that characteristics of freedom are highly correlated with growth in the country and per capita GNP of the country. Mm. My colleagues, Richard Roll and James Talbot, in fact, showed that evidence systematically in which they showed that measures of freedom seem to be able to explain the levels of income in various countries. Mm. And we followed it up with Richard Roll and another colleague, Konak Saxena, who is at uh, University of New South Wales, where we showed that even the volatility of consumption mm. seems to be related to measures of freedom. Countries that are more free see less volatility, mm. less volatility and higher levels of income. Mm. So it's not just that these are well-functioning democracies. That's not just that freedom is intrinsic to well-functioning democracies. It's essential for human well-being. It's essential to human well-being indeed. So the question is, what is the mechanism? What makes that happen? Yeah. What do you think? I think at least with respect to you know, what we're talking about, which is innovation, uh, you know, why does freedom lead to more innovation? I think uh, there are two things at work, right? The first is a selection model. New ideas, radical innovations don't come from people who are reverent to authority and color within the lines. They come from iconoclasts, from misfits, from insubordinate idealists. And I think countries that support or societies that support dissent or encouraging of free speech are more congenial habitats for these kinds of people. There's this great um, article by Paul Graham, the Y Combinator uh, co-founder, yeah. uh, where he profiles hackers. And mm. he says that Steve Jobs and Wozniak uh, in their early days created this blue box, right, which would trick phone systems into allowing free calls. And Wozniak used it to call the Pope. And he says there's something there's some confident empathy uh, and sense of humor about the America of that time, uh, which you know led them to not put these folks in jail and throw away the key, right? right? And that's and he goes on to say that's why Silicon Valley is there. It's no accident, and it's not you know somewhere else. Uh, so I think one is the selection model, right, which is definitely at work. Which is to appreciate dissenters in Correct. the society. And, yes, and that's the second. I think is also there is a large penalty for uh, commenting on sensitive issues. Then, you know, there is this fear of transgression in venturing into any sensitive uh, space. So there's a chilling effect. Exactly, exactly. So if you say you're not allowed to dissent on anything, then... On, on something, on then something. it has the chilling effect of clamping down all forms of speech. Okay. And that, in turn, you prevent then dissemination of ideas, you prevent free exchange of ideas, which is intrinsic to right. innovation, entrepreneurship, growth. So, in fact, dissenters have been useful to society in many, many ways over the centuries. So we also talked about the role of diversity. And mm. you mentioned in one of the episodes, that's what diversity brings. Correct. It brings people who think differently women, minorities, yes. and what have you. Even over the centuries, while countries were confined in their own tribes, ideas traveled through travelers, through trade. So it wasn't just we were exchanging goods, we were exchanging ideas. Correct. And welcoming those ideas is what made a difference. And what do you think limits it? You know, what are the behaviors that limit this, uh, this, this dissemination, free exchange, and free speech? So I think there are two human traits that are really fundamental. 
One is survival. So survival says, get things right. Um, so, and we know that, you know, evolutionarily speaking, we have learned how to take care of ourselves and our progeny. But the second trait human beings need is that of belonging. Mm. Because when you belong to a group, there is risk sharing. I'm a mm. finance professor, so yes, I talk about risk sharing. When you belong to a group, somebody is going to take care of you if there was somebody to attack you. So you want to belong to a group. But the trouble with that belonging to the group is that it brings in closedness and mm. tribalism. And that doesn't like dissenters. You don't yeah. want people to be different. Uh, so we need some other mechanisms to counter that tendency. And this also is, in some sense, inability to separate the idea from the person, what you know, many uh, uh, psychologists have called the fundamental attribution error, right? where you don't say that this is an idea that belongs to the person, but this is the person. And then, uh, aided by technology, which again, you know, I guess we'll have the opportunity to discuss at some point, these tribes start to uh, become more systemic and pervasive leading to a crushing of uh, ideas in general. That's right. I think Gandhi said, Paap se ghada karo, papi se nahi. And what we are saying is the opposite now. We mm. are saying dissenters may be troublemakers, but their dissent is actually useful to the yes. society. Yes. So that's what we think we need. Yes, they are. Dissenters are the source of future wealth and power. And in muting their voices, we all become poorer. I love that. In dissenting the voices of dissenters, we all become poorer. Yes. So on that note, let's stop. Thanks. The fake news is novel. It's easy to make right. things up. Right. Whereas facts are messy. It's right. hard to make them up. And novelty travels much faster.